All right, folks, we're continuing our discussion on bonding. We just wrapped up talking about ionic bonds, and today we're going to begin our discussion on covalent bonds and covalent bonding, and this will actually take up quite a bit of our time in this unit. So ionic bonds, if you recall, are the result of uh, metals losing electrons to form positive ions and nonmetals gaining electrons to form negative ions and the positive and the negative ions are attracted to each other by an electrostatic attraction and we call that the ionic bond. Covalent bonding is different. Now it's easy to understand why sodium and chloride ions are attracted to each other. Sodiums had a positive charge Chlorides had a negative charge, their opposite charges attracted. And that was the electrostatic attraction I just talked about. However, it's not so easy to explain what holds atoms of nonmetals together in what's called a covalent compound. In 1916, Gilbert N. Lewis, one of America's greatest chemists, published a famous paper. The paper was called The Atom and the Molecule. He suggested in this paper that non-ionic molecular compounds arise from the sharing of electrons between atoms. Such a bond is called a covalent bond. So covalent bonding is the sharing of electrons, whereas ionic bonding, as you recall, is the transfer of electrons. So, let's consider a very simple molecule and a very common molecule, H2. We are going to represent the hydrogen atoms by drawing their electron dot pictures. So you can see this hydrogen atom, it has one dot, remember its configuration is 1s1, and this hydrogen atom with one dot. What Gilbert and Lewis proposed is that those hydrogen atoms came close enough to each other to where their 1s orbitals, each with one electron in it, could overlap. And then they would be sharing between the two of them two electrons. So each atom has an electron in the 1s orbital. This orbital is capable of holding one more electron. Remember, hydrogen's configuration is 1s1. Well, we can hold two electrons in that 1s orbital. In fact, when it does hold two electrons in that 1s orbital, it becomes like helium, doesn't it? A noble gas configuration. The theory proposed by Lewis is that the two atoms come close enough to each other so that the 1s orbital from each atom overlaps, and the two electrons, one elect electron from each atom, can now be shared by both nuclei. And so we end up with a structure that looks like this, where that pair of electrons is being shared. Each 1s orbital has two electrons in it, at least part of the time, which is a noble gas configuration for the element helium. If the atoms were human, they'd probably rather have the two electrons to themselves, and there are cases where hydrogen does gain an electron to form an ion, but that is an exception to the rule. Um, here's another example. If I were to draw the dot picture for the fluorine atom, Okay, it has seven valence electrons. Well, here's another fluorine atom. If they were able to get close enough to each other, their orbitals could overlap and they could share a pair of electrons. That shared pair of electrons is also known as a bonding pair of electrons. When that happens, each fluorine, for at least part of the time, has an octet, four pairs of electrons in its outer level. The force that holds the covalent molecule together is the attraction each nucleus has for the electrons being shared. This simultaneous attraction for shared electrons by two nuclei is the rationale behind what we call covalent bonds. Electron dot pictures for molecules are often called Lewis structures. The Lewis structures for H2 and F2 are as follows. H2, the two hydrogen atoms share a pair of electrons. For F2, we put a pair between the two. They also share a pair 
but of course they have some lone pairs or non-bonding pairs as well. These shared pairs are what we call bonding pairs of electrons. All right, so how would we draw the Lewis structure for the molecule HF? Well, let's draw the dot picture for hydrogen. Isn't its dot picture H with one dot? Remember, its electron configuration is 1s1. And fluorine, we just saw its dot picture, doesn't it have three pairs and one by itself? And I'm going to put those three pairs like this and one by itself. We can readily see that as these get close enough to each other, that pair can be shared between the two. So we draw the shared pair. And this fluorine still has those non-bonding pairs surrounding it. Notice that the hydrogen atom is satisfied since it has two valence electrons. The fluorine atom has eight valence electrons. Both of these configurations are the same as a noble gas. Notice that fluorine has an octet of electrons around it. There's something very stable about this seemingly magic number eight. And that brings about something called the octet rule. And the octet rule simply states that atoms tend to react so they can achieve eight electrons in their valence level. So atoms tend to, react, tend to react so they can get to eight electrons in their valence level. We often call these eight electrons in their valence level four pairs. So we say they react to get four pairs of electrons in their outermost energy level. Now, of course, there are some exceptions to this. If you remember, hydrogen only needs one pair in its valence level. Helium, a noble gas, only needs one pair in its valence level. And there are a couple of others that we're going to run into um, during this course. Another one is beryllium. It's satisfied with two pairs, and boron will be satisfied with three pairs. We won't talk too much about them for a while, but just for your information, those are two other exceptions. Now, in covalent bonds, it's important to remember that the electrons are not always shared equally. Let me give you some experimental data. The atomic radius of the hydrogen atom is about 37 picometers. The atomic radius of the fluorine atom is about 72 picometers. Now if we add these two together we end up with a theoretical bond length of about, let's see, 37 picometers, 72 picometers. We end up with a theoretical bond length of about 109 picometers. Now, actual experimental evidence shows that that bond length is only 92 picometers. It's considerably shorter than what we expect it to be. So the question is, why is that bond length shorter than what we would expect it to be? And that deals with a concept called electronegativity. And that's from a previous chapter. Let's redefine that again in our notes here. As you might recall, electronegativity is the tendency, or I should say the relative attraction an atom has for a shared pair of electrons. If you remember, we said fluorine had a very high electronegativity. It's up and to the right on the periodic table. And an atom like francium would have a very, very low electronegativity. It's down and to the left.
Now, to show this, we're going to redraw the Lewis structure for HF right here. We have H sharing a pair with fluorine, and then we have these non-bonding pairs, or lone pairs, that are used to complete fluorine's octet. This pair of electrons ends up spending more time around the fluorine atom than it does around the hydrogen atom. Fluorine has a much higher electronegativity than hydrogen. So to illustrate that, we draw an arrow over the Lewis structure pointing to the more electronegative element, and we put a little plus sign on the other side of that arrow. This shows that since that pair is shared unequally, and it spends more time around the fluorine, the fluorine end of that molecule has a temporary or a negative charge to it, and the hydrogen end of that molecule has a positive charge to it. Now, this, small, this diagram shows that there's something called a dipole. A dipole is the result of electrons being shared unequally. If they're shared unequally, the bond is called a polar bond. If the molecule has electrons being shared unequally, the molecule is called a polar molecule because it has a dipole. Polar molecules act like tiny magnets, and they're responsible for many of the phenomena we take for granted, like our existence. So, let's look up the electronegativities for the following elements and draw the correct dipoles for the bonds formed between the following atoms. I'll do the first two for you, and you can do the second. So, C and H. So, let's look up the electronegativity in our notes, and I have a different diagram here for our lecture, for carbon and hydrogen. Looks like carbons is 2.5, hydrogens is 2.1. So 2.5 for carbon and 2.1 for hydrogen. So if I were to draw a dipole, I would draw my arrow facing the more electronegative element with a plus sign over the more electropositive element. So it would look like that. Let's do it for N and H. The electronegativity for nitrogen is 3.0. We've just looked up hydrogen. It's 2.1. So nitrogen 3.0, hydrogen 2.1. Once again, we're going to draw an arrow to the more electronegative element and put a positive sign over the more electropositive element. Okay, you do the next two and then come back to the video to see if you did it correctly. All right, welcome back. We have oxygen and carbon next. So, oxygen's electronegativity, this should be an O right here, kiddos, is 3.5. And hydrogens, of course, is 2.1. We've looked, or excuse me, and carbons is 2.5. So, oops. So we have 3.5 for oxygen, 2.5 for carbon, and once again, it looks like the arrow is being drawn to the left, and the more electropositive element this time is carbon. Now, what if we have atoms of the same element bonded to each other? Well, since the electronegativity of carbon is 2.5 and the bond is between two carbon atoms, there is no dipole here. This would be a non-polar bond because there is no dipole. Now, one way to classify a bond as ionic or covalent is to determine the electronegativity difference between the bonded atoms. If the difference is greater than 1.7, the bond is considered ionic. If it's less than 1.7, we consider the bond covalent. And the question is why? Well, let's take, for instance, Na being bonded to Cl. Let's take a look at their electronegativities. Sodiums is 0.9. Chlorines is 3.0. All right, 0.9 and 3.0. Isn't that difference? 2.1. That means that the electrons are not shared equally at all. In fact, they are transferred. This would be an ionic bond because the electrons that are being shared, which they're really not in this case, spend almost all of their time around the more electronegative element. They are transferred to the chlorine atom in this case. Sodium loses it, 
chlorine gains it. So when that difference becomes higher than 1.7, we call that an ionic bond. If it's lower than 1.7, we call it covalent because they're sharing more than they are transferring. Okay? When you see each other next time, we'll try to describe this by using a metaphor. I call it my Barbie doll dream house metaphor. So until then, thank you. Bye-bye.